getting ready to warm up. I see if everybody hushes right before the So what's the plan for next? Oh, she's got a job. Where? She got a um, job. Oh, she got an internship last summer, and they liked her enough. They offered her a oh. part time. Five. And no, you always. She's been working part time. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Mr. Calavita, can we have a roll call, please? Uh, Mr. Sawicki. Here. Ms. Williams Galliano. Present. Ms. Driver. Here. Mr. Resnick. Here. Dr. Genovese. Here. Mr. Peters. He's not there yet. Dr. Wilson. Here. <coughs> Dr. Liu is not here yet. Uh, Dr. Littleston. Here. We do have a quorum. Excellent. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law has it was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Hopewell Valley Regional Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof communicated to the Hopewell Valley News and the Times on January 3, 2023. This meeting notice was also sent to Comcast Cable and Verizon Fios. The board reserves the right to enter into executive session during all meetings of the Board of Education. The meeting is being recorded for the purposes of board review, future reference, preparation of the minutes, and viewing on YouTube, Bulldog TV, and the school board's website, www.hvrsd.org. Members of <coughs> Members of the public who intend to participate in public comment, we ask that you sign in prior to speaking. This will assist us in our record keeping and it is up on the podium. Please join me in a flag salute. So we need a first and So I need a first and second on approval of the following minutes for the work session meeting on March 6th and also the regular meeting. Motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries. Tana? Good evening, Dr. Treese, President Williams Galliano, members of the board, and esteemed colleagues. Tonight is truly one of the highlights of the year for our district and the Board of Education. Each year, the Governor's Educator of the Year program honors teachers and educational service professionals throughout the state whose contributions to their students are exceptional. Staff members were nominated by their peers, parents, and students, and I think they're all here this evening. <coughs> a committee from each of the six schools consisting of an administrator, staff members, and a parent representative used the following criteria to select their recipient. Exceptional instructional techniques, superior ability to inspire students of all backgrounds and abilities to learn, respect and admiration of students, parents, and colleagues, and the ability to foster excellence in education as evidenced by ongoing contributions to the improvement of student achievement and the learning environment. At this time, each of our principals will introduce their honorees, and we're gonna go backwards this year. We're gonna start with Colgate, with Ms. Lennon. I always do 
everyone is just right behind me right there. <laughs> so good evening, Dr. Trees, members of the board. I want to first say congratulations to Michelle, Kim, Corinne, Kristen, Ryan, Kathy, Kim, and Simone. Um, over my years in the district, I have had the ability to work with all of you in some capacity. So that says how long I've been here, if I can <laughs> name off all of the teachers of the year or the educators and support professionals. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Lori Talarick from Colgate Grammar School as our 2023 Governor's Educator of the Year. Ms. Talarick came to Hopo Valley in 2014 after graduating from PCNJ. She was a long-term substitute for Chris Morgan, our media specialist back then, and then Deanna Price. Ms. Talarick took a short leave from Hopo Valley to go to a charter school where she taught and then returned to Hopewell for two years in first grade, two years in third, and then back to two years in first grade. Ms. Talarick is currently enrolled in the Schreiber University Teacher Leader Program. I first met Ms. Talarick in the summer of 2016 upstairs in the curriculum summer center um, at a summer PDAC class. She was so eager to learn <coughs> anything and everything about teaching reading. I remember, right, upstairs in that room, we were so excited. Ms. Talarick is also a leader who's constantly reflecting on her craft and asking for feedback. Even with 26 first graders last year in her class, I apprehensively approached her and said, you have to get a new student. She was like, great! <laughs> when? When? Tomorrow? And we were like, just wait a little bit, Lori. I'll give you some time to get a desk. <laughs> Mrs. Talarick is thoughtful, compassionate, dedicated to doing what is best for her students. As a non-tenured teacher, she invited administrators into her room to help her coach her through reading and math strategies. She's also an instrumental part of and serves on several school-based committees. She's helped plan our last splash event, which is our welcome back in August. She's on our Gator Group Planning Committee and also on our Tollgate All Hands, which is our DEI committee. Ms. Talarick received several nominations from parents, fellow teachers, and paraprofessionals. Some parents shared these anecdotes and nom about her nomination. Both of our children have had that one parent. Both of our children have had Ms. Talarick, and she has exceeded our expectations both years. Our son Parker, in 2020, <laughs> had her, and we were amazed at her ability to engage and teach her students both in a virtual and in-class setting. She was always coming up with ways and strategies to suggestions to meet our students' needs and help them thrive despite COVID and the challenging times we were facing. Our son Griffin, Oh, he's over there. <laughs> is currently with Ms. Talarick in first grade. In just a month and a half, we have seen Griffin grow socially and academically. We are so grateful both children had the opportunity to learn from Ms. Talarick. Her energy and enthusiasm for teaching is evident to everyone who speaks with her. She's an incredible asset to our district. From another parent, my daughter had Ms. Talarick in the 2021 school year. Even on Zoom, her positive attitude, zest for life came through. She did a wonderful job guiding our children through a very challenging year. At school, Ms. Talarick is always there, whether it be during recess, helping with kindergarten camp, as one of our new toll gators got to meet her. And we had a great privilege in our family to have Mrs. Talarick for a teacher for four years now. Let me try that math, <laughs> yep. For all three of our children, with that, we've been able to watch Ms. Talarick grow as a teacher, and she is a true standout. While we've had wonderful experiences with all our children's educators, Ms. Talarick has been the gold standard. As great as Ms. Talarick is with the students, she's equally great with the parents, whether it be concerns about our so students' social interactions, speech issues, difficulties with a lesson, or anything else that arises. Ms. Talarick is willing to listen and guide us through that. She is without a doubt a teacher we will cherish forever. And lastly, I promise, what really separates Ms. Talarick from many other teachers is her personality and her nurturing class environment. She always has a smile on her face, even when she's running late and she has to text me with 
the latest saga. <laughs> That's my own added. So the parent continues to say she is so kind and gracious and she has energy that is infectious. I've seen her with numerous times go out of her way to prepare activities for students who are absent, return something to a student on the playground after school who left something, or send students off with care and concern. Even my older child, who has never had Ms. Palarek, likes to say hi to her each day. They know her in the classroom and that their contributions are so valuable. I continue to be thankful for Mrs. Palarek and the nurturing, loving, encouraging environment she has. She has truly commuted a wonderful and an integral part of the Tollgate community. So Tollgate is so lucky to have this wonderful <laughs> teacher. Please join me in congratulating her. Thank you, Ms. Lennon. Next, we'll call up Mr. Wilfing from Stony Brook. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Dr. Trees, for having us here tonight from the Board of Education. Uh, and quite a crowd in the audience here. That's great. Stony Brook, uh, might just, excuse me, might just come back. And I'm come back. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Stony Brook is proud to announce Ms. Corinne Byer has been selected as our Governor Educators, Educator of the Year for 2022-23. Corinne, there she is. Uh, Mrs. Byer has been a valued staff member in Hopewell Valley since 2005. First as a paraprofessional at Stony Brook, and then she moved on and took her skills to Hopewell Elementary, became a fifth grade teacher. In 2015, Corinne returned to Stony Brook, <laughs> this time as a kindergarten teacher. That's right. She moved from fifth grade to kindergarten virtually overnight. And I said, good luck. We're all counting on you. <laughs> uh, but of course, Corinne met this challenge, as she always does, head on and hit the ground running in a new assignment. And moreover, she made it look easy. A consummate professional, Corinne is very giving of her time and always willing to lend a hand to support her colleagues, our school, and this district. Corinne is an active member in many committees uh, at the district level, as well as at Stony Brook, serving on the principal's cabinet. Um, <coughs> in addition, Ms. Byer makes significant contribution to the profession by serving as a host to aspiring educators from our local colleges and universities. As one colleague noted, Corinne has taken every one of us under her wing. She truly treats the Stony Brook community like a family and would do anything for us. Mrs. Byer is one of the most dependable and thoughtful individuals that I know and can always solve a problem with grace and kindness making everyone feel valued and special. Her dedication to this district, love of her colleagues, and commitment to her students, and passion for this profession are truly unmatched. I am very fortunate to be able to call um, Corinne not only as a staff member, but also as a friend, and someone that um, can always be counted on, regardless of the time of day, um, the season of the year. Corinne's always there for you. Um, at this time, I'd like to call her up. Congratulations. Well-deserved honor. We're going to call up uh, interim principal Dr. Scott Fratell from Hopewell Elementary School. Thank you once again. Congratulations to all the recipients out there. Um, th good evening, Dr. Treese, President Williams Galliano, members of the Board of Education, and the Hopewell Valley community. 
I would like to point out, I think the Hopewell community is a little stronger in this room. Just a shout out in that corner over there. Uh, but the Governor's Educator of the Year recipient for Hopewell Elementary School is Michelle Hamilton. <laughs> Ms. Hamilton began, began her employment at Hopewell Elementary in 1999 after teaching for several years in Alaska. Ms. Hamilton was raised in Hopewell Borough and returned to raise her family here. She is invested in the community, taking a very active part in assisting students and families in various ways, as highlighted below in her nominations. She has been a third grade teacher most of her career, uh, minus the pandemic switched to second, gra second grade for a year. While the last few years have been certainly stressful for all educators, Ms. Hamilton had a very unique situation where she demonstrated her expertise as an educator, but more importantly, her care and concern for her students, the school community, and the community at large. While Ms. Hamilton received several nominations, including one from a student who was diagnosed with a cancer in the middle of his third grade school year, he wrote, Ms. Hamilton is the best teacher to have. She makes me feel happy. She made me feel like I was a part of the classroom even when I was not there, sending me pictures when I was in the hospital. When I was in the hospital and I could not have any visitors, she, she still came to see me from the hospital room window. We got to wave to one another as she held signs on the sidewalk below, and I'm proud to have been Ms. Hamilton's student, and I'm so glad she was my teacher. <clears throat> Ms. Hamilton also made sure the family knew that the support of our entire school, um, she worked with her fellow teachers to order, in this school, no one fights cancer alone shirts, collected items to make Easter baskets for this student and his sister, asked for our parents to buy shirts and so each child in the class had one, and led a drive-by parade past the student's house. The parade included teachers and children from throughout the school, Superintendent Dr. Treese, Freddie the Frog, and many others. The class gathered on his front lawn with posters to express their love and support. The playtime the children had that afternoon in his yard was truly priceless. So when he was able to return to school for a short period of time between radiation and chemotherapy, of course, Ms. Hamilton organized the clap-in to welcome him back to school. Ms. Hamilton has clearly been an absolute treasure to our family, school, and the community, and HES is truly blessed to have her as a teacher. So I know as I see Ms. Lackabadera in the corner over there, as well as the whole Hope Elementary School staff and, and community, congratulations, Michelle. We have more tissues if anybody needs them. <laughs> um, and last but not least from our elementary schools, uh, Mr. Turnbull from Bear Tavern. Good evening, Board of Education. Good evening, Dr. Priest. And good evening, families and recipients of this year's Governor's Educator of the Year. And it's an amazing thing to even sit out and, and listen to the other speeches and to, to see the amazing things happening throughout our district. Um, it, it brings such a sense of pride. So um, congratulations to, to everyone who's um, being recognized tonight. But I'm very excited to introduce this year's Bear Tavern Governor's Educator of the Year, Mrs. Kim Niefer. This educator has been teaching at Bear Tavern for over 20 years and has proven that she can teach literally anything, any grade, any type of class, and any student. She's an absolute master of classroom climate, and while most of the education world is sprinting to prioritize social and emotional skills coming out of the pandemic, she's staying the course because she made it cool to be a responsive educator more than 20 years ago. Before we got here today, she was working with my staff and leading a personal, uh, professional development session at our faculty meeting. Uh, she is the real thing every single day, all day long. And Mrs. Niefer creates such a safe and joyful, inclusive learning environment for her students and their families. It's truly impossible to not succeed in her class. She puts forth immeasurable time and effort to get to know each and every student on a level that helps her to form deep connections, enhance motivation, and create a sense of community among her students and their families. The staff, and mostly the principal, 
go to her for advice, tips, and input because she is calm in any situation. She is supportive of everybody, collaborative, and non-judgmental. The amount of planning and preparation that she puts into everything that she does is astounding. And this year's recipient is universally res respected inside of Bear Tavern and throughout our community. One parent commented that it was remarkable how well Mrs. Niefer got to know each one of her students and their individual characteristics, and then use that information to connect with them and motivate them to help them succeed. And a staff member said that Kim is a true leader at Bear Tavern. She has taught everything from fourth and fifth grade to kindergarten and first grade, basic skills, and even special education. She taught remotely during the pandemic with incredible success and can truly do anything. She's firm and consistent, but at the same time, calm and loving, all at the exact same time. And she establishes lasting, solid relationships with everyone around. Kim Niefer is the 2022 Bear Tavern Governor's Educator of the Year, and it is a truly deserved honor. We're extremely proud and grateful to recognize Kim. All right, next we have Ms. Gianfredi from Timberlane Middle School. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Good evening, Dr. Treese, Ms. Gallagher Williams, members of the board, Hopeful Valley community. As we move from the craziness of the pandemic into quote unquote normalcy, the strong connection with students became more critical than ever for instruction, for engagement, and for supporting our students on a daily basis. For Ms. Gennaro, connection to her students had always been on the forefront of her instruction before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now. Kristen Gennaro is a Timberlane and Central High School graduate. After graduating in 2008, she went on to Radford University and then Virginia for graduate school. But Kristen's desire to be a teacher started long before that, when she was here in third grade, when she wanted to be just like her teacher, Ms. Benke, who is now Stony Brook teacher, Ms. Susan Hamill. While at Timberlane, Kristen has ta taught several grade levels in different departments and faces every new si situation with creativity, dedication, and student-centered instruction. She is a quiet yet positive force in our school, always putting students first. She deserves recognition not only for her instruction in the classroom, but as, but as she is dedicated to so many other aspects of Timberlane. From her role to yearbook co-advisor, the videographer and editor of the student recognition videos, to the student council co-advisor, we're just painting our staff room over the summer. She has dedicated hours to ensuring that Timberlane is a warm, inviting environment for all who enter. To capture a few comments from her nominations, here are what her students say about her. Ms. Gennaro is always willing to help me, and I can go to her for anything. She is so supportive. She has helped me more than any teacher ever has. Ms. Gennaro is an amazing teacher. She makes our classroom feel safe, and I love learning in her room. She understands kids. She helps kids feel comfortable in her classroom, which helps students look forward to class, which makes them want to learn. Kristen's dedication is second to none, but I don't think I can say it any better than the quintessential middle school language from a student nomination. Ms. Gennaro is a girl boss. <laughs> she slays so much, she is a queen and the best teacher I ever had. <laughs> Kristen and I started our journeys at Timberlane together, and I couldn't be more proud to introduce her as the 2002 Educator of the Year. And now from Central High School, Ms. Riley. Good evening, Dr. Treese, President Galeano Williams, members of the Board of Education, and members of the Hopewell Valley community. I would like to congratulate all of the educators of the year and the educational support professionals of the year. I've had the opportunity to work with many of you during my time here in Hopewell Valley, and my children have been fortunate enough to work with many of you during their time in the district. Special thanks to Ms. Simone for getting Kate through Peach. Thank you. 
You are truly all an amazing group. But I would like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the HPCHS Educator of the Year, Mr. Ryan Tobin. You may be asking yourself, where is this Ryan Tobin person? Well, Mr. Ryan Tobin is such an exceptional educator that when he was given the choice between coming here and hearing all sorts of amazing things about himself or taking a long bus ride to Hillsboro with a bunch of boys volleyball players, <laughs> he chose to go with the boys volleyball players <laughs> because he is the JV coach and he did not want to let his team down. That tells you a little bit about the type of person Mr. Tobin is. Ryan Tobin has been a special education teacher at HVCHS since 2014. Over the past eight years, Mr. Tobin has impacted the lives of hundreds of students and expanded their educational horizons in a meaningful, purposeful way. As one of his colleagues stated, the length to which Ryan goes to reach these kids to find something compelling in their lives with which to make a connection and seek a touchstone to bridge their lives to the curriculum is without measure. He has and uses every tool in the teacher's toolbox. He meets every student where they are with respect, dignity, humor, and support. Mr. Tobin's ability to connect with each and every student extends far beyond the classroom. In his role as the volleyball coach, the class advisor, the extended school year instructor, the key club advisor, and a mentor, he makes connection a priority. As another colleague shared, Ryan has a natural and effortless way with his students. He treats them with respect, he speaks in their language, and makes connections irrespective of background, ability, or age. His presence and persona create a strong and genuine rapport that in turn establishes a safe and encouraging learning environment for all children. Working with Brian Tobin has helped me to become a better educator, a better principal, and a better person. And I am so proud to introduce him, even though he's not here, as our Educator of the Year. So this evening we are also honoring three support staff professionals from Hopewell Valley for their hard work and dedication to the district. Eligible candidates included paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, maintenance workers, bus drivers, van attendants, campus safety officers, and the technology department. A committee consisting of myself, the Director of Facilities, Tom Quinn, Director of Pupil Services, Paulette DiNardo, Director of Transportation, Heather Van Mater, and other support professionals reviewed nominations and selected individuals based on the following criteria dedication to their job, inspiring, and making a difference in the lives of staff, parents, and students. I know he was very excited when he was up here earlier, so let's bring back Mr. Wolfing mm -hmm. to the podium so he can introduce his support professional of the year. Uh, this evening, I have the privilege of introducing to you the one of the Hopewell Valley Support Professional of the Year, Ms. Kathy Matthews. Yeah. I haven't even said anything about her yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Matthews joined the district and Stony Brook in twenty, excuse me, in two thousand three as a paraprofessional. The following year, she joined the main office team as school secretary. And Kathy has been a mainstay at Stony Brook and a major contributor to the success of our school community ever, every day since that time. Kathy is committed to the, the success and well-being of our school and is the one who makes sure that the special things happen that truly make our school more than just a place to work or to be educated. A quote from one of the nominations was, uh, Kathy welcomed me to Stony Brook with open arms and a staff t-shirt so that I had some school swag to wear on dress down days. That may seem like a small detail, but it's not. The fact that she cared from the start, that I felt like I was part of the Stony Brook family meant so much to me, and she has continued to make me feel right at home ever since. And it's true, Kathy goes well beyond the scope of what her job responsibilities are. And it goes right into the heart of what our school is all about. 
from being part of our spirit committee that recognizes holidays and meaningful events in the lives of our staff and making sure that all those milestone moments make it into the fifth grade video for the end of the year. <coughs> Kathy has impeccable taste in music. Her sports selection, her sports themes, not so much. <laughs> Still in all, I right, please join me in congratulating Mrs. Kathy Matthews as our support professional of the year. And I need to finish with, thanks pal, you're the greatest. You're the greatest, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's bring Dr. Bertel back up from Hopewell Elementary. Had me with the first team. All right, once again, uh, good evening, Dr. Treese, President, President William Galliano, uh, members of the Board of Education, as well as the Hopewell Valley community. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of informing you that Ms. Simone Rodriguez has been recognized as a support staff professional of the year. <laughs> Ms. Rodriguez has been a Hopewell Valley Regional School District Power Professional since 2008. She has supported various general and special education classes, most recently in our preschool programs. Ms. Rodriguez is knowledgeable about students and families and is constantly looking to build a rapport with them. One of her colleagues noted in her recommendation the following. Ms. Rodriguez was someone I trust to help out in a general, gentle and helpful manner. She cares deeply about the kids in her classroom and wants what is best for them. In addition to being an accommodating power professional, Simone has a natural teacher side to her too. She always is on the go and never wastes any time. If she's not sitting with the kids supporting their work or leading a center, helping with the student behavior or encouraging the children, she is always one or two steps ahead of me prepping materials, organizing student work, or going through student folders. These are just some of the many wonderful attributes that Ms. Rodriguez has brought certainly to the classrooms. And in my short period of time working with her at Hopewell Elementary School, I have quickly realized how important she is to the Hopewell Elementary School community. So, Congratulations once again, Simone, and thank you for all you do for our HSC HSC families. Thank you. And I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Tom Quinn, our director of facilities. Hello, welcome everyone. I have a quick public service announcement. Um, <laughs> there's a gray Ford outside uh, with a CarMax uh, logo on it. License plate number M73FBA. Your headlights are on. <laughs> so that belongs to anybody. Um, but the real reason I'm here tonight is to um, celebrate uh, Tim Wolverton as being chosen a as a support staff member of the year. Uh, Tim has been with us uh, a little, probably a little over three years, so not, not a whole lot of time, but he has made a, a certain impact on everyone uh, in the district. Um, Tim started out in the grounds department. Um, we quickly moved him up to um, what's called a, a PM position, which is preventative maintenance. So he's on the roof. He's doing um, filter changes constantly, thousands of them a year. Uh, he works on all the um, machinery for the belts to make sure that um, we don't have breakdowns. The idea is that the better we do preventative maintenance on, the less breakdowns we actually end up with. Um, a couple years ago, we were in a bit of a bind, and the band needed uh, someone to drive the box truck. And I reached out to all my guys, and Tim immediately responded back. And not only said that he would take a couple of the days, but said, don't worry about it, I've got the entire thing. And he has been helping the band parents and the color guard and everything else in that department now for the last several years, transporting them around. It's something he uh, gets a lot of joy out of, and if you are a band parent, you know that. You can see it in the way he interacts with people. 
that uh, there's a lot of pleasure um, that comes out of that for him. So I um, couldn't be more proud than to celebrate Tim Wolverton. Congratulations again to all of our honorees this evening. Thank you for being here and for all that you do for our students. We do want to take a picture outside, so if everyone could just move out to the hallway so we can get that picture, thank you so much. So we'll take that quick break. I know some of the kiddos would like, and not, some of the kiddos would like to get out of here. Um, and then we're gonna take that break to take the picture and then we'll resume the board meeting. We'll start with your presentation. Party. 
Are we all back? <laughs> you know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Including my eyes, don't you remember? <laughs> also wanted to eat I could keep it out thinking anything about it <laughs> the Aaron oh yeah I thought you were saying it was the cold I, I was like no it's Okay, thank you all for that. We're going to go ahead and move on to our student representative. Thank you, Angela. Good evening, everyone. I hope that everyone has been well and had a great spring break. To recap the events of the spring spirit week, the freshman class won the hallway decorating competition promoting their charity Palm Kids. The class of 2026, 2024, and 2023 are all in the process of selling and advertising their kits. At the CHS cafeteria. The Junior Palm will be held on May 6th at CHS, and ticket sales are due by this Wednesday. The Senior Palm will be on June 2nd, and tickets are being sold from this Wednesday till May 5th. At the end of March, the Youth Environmental Society went to Washington, D.C. They met with seven different representatives including Bonnie Watson Coleman and others to ask them to co-sponsor two resolutions, one on climate education and the other on mental health advocacy in a, chi in a changing climate. The Yes Club also prepared a majorly successful Green Week starting last Monday. On Monday, students met with Naimovi Morris, a youth climate activist from Uganda. On Tuesday, the Yes Club presented their DC trip to other students. The next day, students learned about the mental health impacts of climate change with Ms. Lee and on Thursday, the Yes Club had students hold a climate solutions fair where each <coughs> member made posters on different climate solutions. We are also in the process of preparing for the student council officers for 2024, as well as the class officers for rising 10th through 12th graders. Applications for these positions will be due on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you so much. As always, you're more than welcome to stay, but we 
totally understand. Oh, yeah. wait, wait, before, I'm sorry, before, were there any questions from anyone on the board? Okay, great. Well, thank you. She, she had one foot out the door. <laughs> Which we completely understand. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, moving on. Um, I just want to take a quick moment um, to acknowledge each and every one of our staff and um, our teachers who were recognized. It is always amazing to hear what everyone is doing within their schools and within their classrooms and with their families and students. We appreciate immensely, but m most of all, it just leaves me with such a sense of pride that we have the amazing skills um, uh, of all of these talented individuals. I also want to take a quick moment to note that later in the agenda we'll be um, going over budget and things like that. And I truly, truly, truly want to acknowledge the administrative body as well as the teachers of the entire um, district who really looked to challenge themselves to look at things newly, to figure out how we can approach each uh, of our challenges in the budget um, with a fresh look. Um, so I just want to acknowledge Bob has done an always does an amazing um, effort, but rallying um, each of the uh, stakeholders has been critical. And um, I think everyone feels very well heard, so thank you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Therese, if she has anything. Um, well, I have uh, my report, but I was going to wait for you to see an egg pop. Do you want me to do that now? Uh, or yeah. just so we can get to the next one? All right. So. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. So that should be okay. You. Yes. Now, um, these positions are also posted in, um, so this is going to be touching on a couple of committees that we'll be presenting tonight. One is the uh, personnel committee will be uh, approving these um, job titles for these two roles. And we also presented this to the education program committee. Um, just a little history about um, teacher leaders. We have and we do have on our books teacher leaders. Um, we had them in, in the elementary schools and the middle schools prior to having STEM facilitators. And um, their roles were slightly different than they are than the ones we're proposing now. Um, and understand that um, this discussion is coming forth now to the larger community um, that I presented to the ed that we presented Dr. Plitzis and I who couldn't be here tonight to the EdCom committee out of a need with our teachers of needing more support um, and also having a very very tight budget. So we haven't eliminated uh, the STEM facilitator positions, but they are going to be on pause for a year. And I'm going to walk you through um, why this was proposed to the um, to the board. Thank you. So um, the first um, thing uh, that brought this conversation back, and we've had this discussion in the past. We've been monitoring this for the past um, four years prior to me uh, coming to the role as superintendent. As assistant soup, we were seeing gaps in our um, English language uh, arts curriculum and in the math curriculum and certainly in the performance of our students. We were seeing our scores drop in both these areas um, for two very different reasons. One um, is is our our teachers um, working with two different curricula, starting with one wor math workshop, which was new to them, and then having to adopt a new one after that one expired, um, right in the middle of COVID. And then we had the um, the changes that have that we've seen in language arts. Right, a lot of you have been reading in the papers about um, the science of of reading and balanced literacy and and reading writing workshop and that a number of students are losing ground in our re in reading writing performance based on schools leaning more heavily on writing workshop and less on the mechanics and the science of how students learn to read. So teachers were, were saying that they needed the support. We were seeing our numbers and our scores drop and a pandemic made it worse for everyone. That, that kind of deepened the, 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 um, the issues that we had. Um, so we saw the gaps in the learning and um, Again, these were exponential after COVID, and we also saw the rise in our, in our um, special ed numbers. Our, we went from like a 17% classification rate, which was already very high. Most people should be like at a seven or eight, 
we were already at 17 and now we're at 22 percent and i believe and i in Mr. Nardo, who if she were here tonight, would also say that a lot of that is due to gaps in learning. It's not really that these students would have been classified had we been supporting them at the, um, the first tier level, the classroom level. So that was one of the problems that we had identified and have been monitoring over the course of the years. Additionally, we saw gaps in our, in our curriculum that needed to be corrected. A lot of that work has already occurred where we put these programs and this training back in place for our teachers, but they feel like they need that support um, we've had a lot of teachers retire. We have new teachers that are coming in that we're still training and trying to support at the classroom level. And the teachers came to us multiple times this year saying, these 12 K-12 positions that are so enormous where someone's in charge of all the way up to the 12th grade, we need the support at the elementary level. And a lot of times when you hire for these positions, you end up hiring somebody that's a secondary person because you need that content understanding at the secondary level and then you work backwards. So they were saying that we need support at the elementary level, specifically in our mathematics, science, and ELA curriculum, ELA, because elementary teachers are required to teach all of the subjects. And they were not feeling they had the support that they needed in those content areas. But we have a budget crisis. So though I wanted to add these teacher leader positions back, I can't afford to pay for that and the STEM facilitators at least this year. So this is what the objective was. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, to provide targeted support to our faculty administrative team in the areas of literacy, science, math, and technology. So that was our objective. You can go to the next slide. So what um, Dr. Plitzis and I pr proposed to the uh, board was that we take the monies that we were using for, this, for the STEM facilitators, and there was some flux happening with them, the STEM facilitators anyway, with, uh, with um, folks um, requesting um, transfers and then some people leaving that we had an opportunity to kind of do this um, instead of doing a job search and then really having, you know, reinforcing a position that wasn't giving us what we need right now. Um, though the STEM facilitators do an amazing job, and I'm going to say that we still need them, um, but we're going to put them on pause right now to pay for these positions for now. Um, the, the literacy uh, teacher leaders, um, would, there would be, we're proposing two, one for grades pre-K to two, that grade band where critical, uh, it's critical that reading uh, intervention happens um, before third grade and make sure that we're really, really dealing with the mechanics or, or dealing with the science of reading and teaching phonolo uh, phonology, phonemic awareness, word study, really making sure that our readers are getting a strong foundation pre-K to two. And then literacy, a literacy teacher leader, grade band three to five. These folks would answer, these are not supervisor of position, these are teacher coaches. They will um, work with the supervisor of ELA, which is a K-12 position, and the social studies uh, uh, K-12 uh, supervisor to support literacy development in those areas. Then the second um, two would be math, science, technology teacher leaders, pre-K to two again, and then also one at three, five. The reason why we're choosing to do the, the grade bands in this way is to make sure that we have continuity in the way the curriculum is being monitored, rolled out, and all of the elementary schools, because those people will be looking at it across four schools instead of um, just one, and not working in a silo. They'll be able to support each other in that. The job responsibilities. Support PLCs, the pr professional learning communities at each grade level to make sure that we're implementing the, uh, the curriculum consistently and, uh, and uh, the same across the schools. Coordinate, develop, and facilitate professional development opportunities for instructional best practices. Provide instructional coaching to their colleagues. Again, they're not supervisors, so they're not coming in um, with a punitive lens. They're coming in and let me support you in your practice. Let me co-teach with you if you're struggling. Let me show you how to group. Let me show you how to use the assessments, the benchmarks, get a hold of the supplies if you need them. Um, they will evaluate and revise curriculum materials as well during the course of the year if needed and they'll support the data warehousing and the communication of that data to the teachers and package it so that they can take that and then now run with it in their classroom, which is, you know, we have lots of data, but having someone to break it down to you and say, here, these are your kiddos, let me show you how to group them, and these are the skills they're missing, and not just these are the skills, but here is the tool that you can use in that classroom to teach that student. So the, the teachers are very excited about getting the support, um, and that uh, this, this role would not be something that the STEM facilitator would do because that's, their role is quite different. Um, 
the uh, experience required for this is four years teaching experience, experience teaching multiple grade levels preferred, it wasn't necessary, um, evidence of uh, previous experience coaching, leading PD, um, participation in school-based uh, district-wide committee work, and demonstration of expertise of instructional pedagogy and data interpretation and integration in the content area they're implying, whether that's math and science or the literacy role. So we presented this to the EDCOM committee, um, and that'll be shared here momentarily with, um, with the um, committee chair. But they did um, have these concerns. One is they do not want to lose the STEM facilitator position, even though they know right now funding it and funding this are going to be difficult. Um, I expressed to them my concern that, you know, right now, you know, we are, are hemorrhaging and we have a triage that we need to do to get our kids back on track that I want our kids to have this, the, the math and literacy skills to not just get excited about these STEM posi uh, positions that are available in the world that we need competent people to take a hold of. Um, but they need to have the base and the foundation to be able to do the job once they get it, right? Um, so they agreed that this could be a pilot for these positions, understanding that they don't think four of these, two and two is gonna be enough. They would like us to expand it in the future in addition to bringing back the STEM facilitator. So this brings a challenge to my team here to come up with how we're going to fund that next year and we're going to we're definitely um, have that on our plate to do and are committed to doing just that um, they want to see um, that if, and that's if it improves we're not just going to expand this if we're not seeing it in our in our in improving in our scores um, bring back stem facilitators um, in, a ro in a role where they are they're um, consistent across the district our stem facilitators do a phenomenal job all students don't experience our STEM facilitators great work because they are invited in by the teacher. Um, when we bring them back, we would like something, they've asked us to have something consistent where all kids are experiencing that sort of like of an exploratory experience. And so really all, um, having that is something all kids rotate through just like they do world language, wellness, um, and the other exploratories they have in their classes, art and music. Couldn't think of the other one. Um, continue to find support for teachers at the at the um, classroom level beyond that um, If they're saying they need this help make sure we're providing that PD and then also ensuring that there's equity in the instruction that's going on in all four elementary schools, whether it's our STEM facilitators or what our, our coaches and our supervisors are overseeing So moving forward, this is the plan We are adopting a new master schedule at the middle school in the 24 25 school year um, in that, uh, our priorities are that we have a full block for language arts, we have a full block for math that support workshop and students being getting the support they need at the classroom level. We're also supporting our gifted and talented students and the twice exceptional students in, our, in the classroom um, and that that space is available during the classroom day and that tier one support is happening for all of our students in, in English language arts and math. So that pull out our push in that they need in the school day. Um, schedule will also contain those those exploratory courses those elective courses that we value and they're really exploratory because all the kids get them They're not electing to take them are in music and art and world language and the stem lab and the stem You know bringing that stem back the labs will still be there. They still are allowed to be used by teachers They always have been but to have that stem facilitator giving that service all the time in that lab as part of an exploratory experience ensuring the continuity of those experiences in all four schools. So there's a, a curriculum that all the schools are experiencing. And then also we're looking to departmentalize, it happens at, at some of our elementary schools and not all, in grades four and five in, in um, math, language, arts, social studies, and science. Um, instead of teachers having to be responsible for, for all four of those subject areas, as, as the content is getting more difficult, they would be responsible for two and then we can really hone in and focus in on the instruction and their support in their professional development. So that is the plan that's going to happen in the next year. That's gonna take a lot of planning, um, curriculum writing. I know this is a change, um, but this is something that I strongly believe is going to help us, one, stop the bleeding that's happening with our, our scores, get us back on track with, our, with the students that have lost learning or just didn't acquire it because of the pandemic. But we were seeing this problem before the pandemic and I think now with our limited resources this is what's best for us right now knowing that listen I, I know what this community values 
I know what you, what you all want from us, and I, I absolutely want the same things. I wish I could fund all of this right now, but I can't. So this is what I'm recommending would be the best thing for right now, and um, moving forward, um, that be the plan to fix it. Um, one more thing I want to say um, just quickly before I go. Um, you know, you want to put the next one up. I know that, um, that, that uh, change can be tough, and change without growth is, is, is not useful, right? But if we don't have change, we certainly are not going to have growth. And right now, I feel like this is what we need right now to, you know, I was talking to, um, to somebody about this analogy earlier. We, you know, we're baking a beautiful cake, and we have all the icing and the cherries on top with the phenomenal work our STEM facilitators do. Their job was not designed to do all the things I just said. So it's not fair to say, well, they weren't working because they were working and doing what we asked them to do. And I, I know that's still valuable. But right now, this is what it is that we're struggling with. Um, and I just need to get us back on track as a district. And, I, and our teachers are asking us to help them get back on track. So thank you for that. Um, just This is not on that topic. Um, but I wanted to share my next two um, superintendent um, coffee and chats. Um, I will be sending this out to the whole community in an email. But you're seeing it first. Um, we're going to do one on mental health and um, school safety. I've gotten emails. We've had some. Um, some mass shootings of late. We've had some smaller scale shootings of late um, and, and issues going on in our community around um, violence, gun violence in particular. Uh, I am going to have a coffee and ch uh, uh, a chat on May 18th. While I will talk some about the, um, uh, the way we handle security, and we did have a large presentation about that with our police in October, um, I'm going to table any real in-depth conversations about arming guards and all of that um, because I have Ms. Um, Smith, who's in charge of our, our um, safety and security, along with myself, and uh, Mr. Calavita, are going to, they're working right now to get numbers for you all on what does it cost to do that as a district and have those in-house, to have SROs that the police are, or have the umbrella or a combination of both, or hiring an outside security firm. I want you all as a community to have all the numbers, all the risk and, and, and liability to the district, and hear from the police chief, chief on his thoughts on it before we make a decision because there's some big numbers involved in addition to all the, the, the um, pieces that we have to do to make sure that our, our, um, if we're going down that road as a route as a community that we're prepared to do that. Um, right now, our, most of our SROs are able to, um, but it's just a matter of what this community wants us to do. But I will talk about mental health, which is a big piece to keep the need for this to happen in the first place on that night as well. And then on June 7th, getting ready for, for uh, a long summer vacation and, uh, with uh, your children, we're going to do a drug awareness and drug discussion and safety on June 7th. The police chief or, or our lazy liaison will come, and he's going to actually bring some samples of things that might be hiding in plain sight in somebody's house or around, so you can kind of see what's out there in the streets and what kids might be seeing or, or you know, have access to. And we'll talk to you, and he'll talk to you about some ways that we can protect our kids over the summer. And we'll share what we're doing as a district to try to prevent um, drug use and abuse in our school. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> I know. It's a lot. No oh, yeah, questions. Um, yeah, if I did have a question, th thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Treese, <laughs> for giving the overview. I just want to make sure I understood. So in terms of the new positions, are those intended to be district-wide, full-time responsibilities for those those positions yes okay so that so just to make clear that's different from like you said the teacher leader positions we had yes several years ago where they still had classes but then they did that as yes part of their time okay yes and and just just so I you know so I can understand another too what was it about uh, in, in this circumstance which drove you to the the full-time type of of position versus what we had before. So the elementaries before were full-time positions. Remember when we had the teacher leaders, the elementary school was full-time, and the um, the high school and the middle school were not, and they got a stipend. We do want to bring the high school and the middle school ones back at some point, but they will be stipends. They'll be teaching, and they'll, they won't have a duty, and I think they, they, did, they taught a little less. They didn't have a duty, and then they got a stipend to pay for their teacher leader school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying. I also have a quick question. Um, you mentioned 
about the the balanced reading and the science of reading. So is our district moving to like away from balanced reading with the new research? And would that be part of these new positions job to help support the teacher? Yes. So the, the research says, and we were already, we had already picked up on it before the, the newspaper articles blew up. Our, um, we have a very, um, very talented reading specialist, Michelle Maglione, who is our special education reading specialist, who identified this issue before the pandemic. We saw our numbers growing, and um, EdCom, whoever was on EdCom at the time remembers that we discussed it, and she identified this was the issue. We went down the road of investing in Haggerty, which is, a, is the program that we use uh, for the phonemic awareness and developing and manipulating sound and all of that within word study through uh, K through two. We trained all of our teachers, they started implementing it, then the pandemic happened, and then everything blew up again. So we already own Haggerty, our teachers have been trained. Now it's just making sure we do it consistency, consistently, making sure we have a full block of time that's dedicated to this happening K to two, and I think that Vicki and, and, and um, Amy and the group are already looking at adding it to three as well. So yes, they would be in charge of doing that. Reading workshop will not go away, but more focus on that reading workshop in the upper grades and then just letting them dabble in it in, in the primary grades. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I, I appreciate the district really following the science. It's important. So yes. Congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Anything else? Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Therese. Okay, um, so we're going to go ahead and move to the next agenda item, public hearing on the special opportunity for the budget. Okay, it seems like the budget's been going on now for a long time. <laughs> it has. Um, but we are uh, approving tonight the final adoption. What we did in March was the tentative adoption to be submitted to uh, the county. Um, it came back from the county with no uh, comments or adjustments, so that was good. Um, so now we present it to you tonight for the final uh, approval and then implementation uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. So just where we started, we started with um, you know the things that we value uh, in our budget. It goes from everything from working through our mission statement to maintaining the, the New Jersey learning standards. Um, and again, forging a path that leads us towards the future, which is why we did a lot of the things that we're doing this year to get us uh, established for next year. Some of the drivers in this year's budget that we dealt with, um, rising health insurance costs, uh, transportation, the cost of renewals, drivers and fuel. Uh, in general, just the cost for energy. Uh, the unanticipated facility ma and maintenance costs that we have, we have uh, several buildings that are approaching 100 years, and even now our youngest building is in excess of 20 years. And we never thought that Stony Brook was our new building, but it's not quite so new anymore. Property, uh, special education, we talked about the out-of-district tuition that we're facing, the increases that we're facing, 10, 20, uh, 11, 12% uh, for some of those services that are necessary for our students. Um, property and casualty insurance, workers' compensation insurance, all at uh, record highs this year. The, the market for insurance um, is, is rising. Uh, workers' compensation is being affected by, believe it or not, judges and, and the laws that New Jersey is passing um, that are making more and more uh, things com uh, compensable. So we're dealing with those. Again, the, the, the curriculum instruction issues we just spoke about, um, our curriculum is always evolving, changing, and adapting, and, and we need to include that into our budget. And staffing. Um, you know, the, our, the majority of our budget is staffing. Um, it's what we do. We educate children, and that's a service. And we um, have had increases uh, due to inflation uh, in our contracts that, we're, that we approve. So where we started, we had a... a a shortfall as we started the budget plan this year of somewhere in the area of $4.2 million. We made an initial pass to try to reduce that. We uh, used, we estimated an additional 600000 in state aid. 
We had bank cap from previous years of 268,000 and we used a health benefit waiver of 1.5 million um, to try to close that gap. It still left us about $1.8 million short. Um, the board challenged us to come up with some um, solutions that didn't have a huge impact on our educational program. So we got together, Dr. Treese got her administrative team together and we came up with some solutions that we shared with the board on March 6th. And these are some of the things that, these are the things that we presented to the board and how we got um, to a final number. Um, a lot of these will be through attrition. Um, we could, we did, were able to realize some uh, instructional staff reductions due to some enrollment issues. Uh, breakage, which means a younger staff or a, a less expensive staff member um, replacing a more expensive staff member on retirements. Um, we started to reduce some software platforms. Platform, we had some platform software that did the same or similar to some others. We consolidated where we could. Um, Doc, uh, Paul, uh, Ms. Donardo came up with some uh, added district tuitions that she was able to pull back. The students either came into district or were uh, no longer coming into the district, they, they left. And we're gonna delay some technology upgrades, mostly in the, in the manner of some servers, um, some high-end equipment that we're able to push off uh, for a year and we hope to uh, tackle that next year. Further challenged by the board, what else could we touch if we wanted to uh, make some more uh, reductions to limit the uh, tax burden on the, the community? These were things that the administration did not recommend. They are not in any kind of order, um, but, but some of the things that we, rec that we brought to the board for their consideration, but we did not recommend. Um, after that meeting, the items that are in color will be put forth um, to be addressed by our various committees over the course of the next year prior to the development of the 24-25 budget um, for either reinstatement, altering, uh, reductions, but there'll be discussions on those four items as we move forward um, next year. Doesn't mean that's all we're going to discuss next year. Um, as you heard Dr. Treese mention some things that she's looking to either put back, amend, but these are some of the things that we're going to focus on um, in the in the 23-24 budget year. Our budget right now is um, up 5.7%. Um, we focus on the blue line, the operating expenses. That's what it takes to run our day-to-day -day operation of about 5%. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, it's driven largely by our benefits, our transportation costs, and our staffing. And the sources of our revenues, obviously in, in New Jersey, we must have a balanced set of uh, expenditures and revenues. Um, we do have a 4.1% increase in the tax levy. Um, the general fund tax levy and the overall budget is up 5.7%. We are a heavily funded district on local on the local um, sources. Property taxes are 86% of our budget. Some other revenues that we're able to generate are about 1% of our budget from tuitions, the transportation fees we charge, and charges for folks to use our buildings, which are used pretty much six to seven days a week. And we have 5% of money that we have been able to save over the years. We put that back into the budget. State funding is around 7%. It's up slightly uh, from last year. Uh, last year was probably 6.5%. And federal funding, uh, which is really less than 1% of our budget, it's basically dollar in, dollar out. It's um, money that goes toward some of our more needy populations. Um, our, again, more support for our special ed uh, students. But again, these are, these are uh, entitlement grants. We submit um, applications for these and we get them for a very specific purpose. It doesn't typically go to, to uh, fund our general operation. And just a, 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 a pictorial description of where our money goes. If you start at 12 o'clock and you move around to not the nine o'clock hour, um, the majority of our budget goes into our edu direct education and staff benefits. Um, that's where the majority of our instruction goes. Transportation encompasses another uh, big portion. So again, the majority of what we do is going directly into the education of students. So again, 
with this year, the overall increase to the budget, the total at the bottom, 4.1%. It's larger than the 2% that's uh, statutory because we did use bank cap and a health benefit waiver from years past. What does that increase mean? It means a 7 for 7 cent increase to Hopewell Borough, a 3 cent increase to Hopewell Township, and a 15 cent increase to Pennington Borough. The average homeowner, uh, the average tax rate will be uh, $1.82 and would be a $296 increase for the average homeowner. The average home in each of the municipalities hovers right in the $500,000 area. Um, again, $172 in Hopewell Township and $703 in Pennington Borough. That's the end. We At this point, we can open it up for questions from the board and then the public in our open public comment portion of it. Thank you, Bob. Questions from the board? I, I had two questions, Bob. One was just, I think I saw the number, the, the use of fund balance this year is about $4.7 million. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple years ago, we were really trying to get that number down uh, to like the two and a half million dollar range. So um, one, is that due to inflation that's occurred this year? No, it's, well, it's it, basically $1.7 million of that is going directly towards a capital project. So it kind of right. skews that number. So as we've talked for many years, the best use of surplus are one-time expenditures and we are using it we're, we're a little bit higher than that two and a half percent on the general operation, mm -hmm. but because we're putting 1.7 million towards that uh, chiller boiler project at Hobo Elementary, it's not as uh, big an impact. Okay. One of the main reasons I, I just asked that was from the standpoint of, it's always a challenge every year to generate the fund balance, but this year has been particularly difficult as we've seen over the last yep. nine months. So, you know, from that standpoint, um, you know, any great concerns about us being able to actually generate that amount of fund balance? I think we're I think we're okay right now. We had a little bit of play when we did our last quarterly report um, in what do we do it March. Um, we're watching it. We do have the um, uh, reserve account for our health benefits. Should we run into trouble there? But I think we'll be okay with maintaining the number that we needed to hit for this year. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it has been a difficult year with with uh, expenses expenses trending way way higher due to the inflation every period that we're in right now. Okay, the other question I had was related to the fact you know now that we've had the budget go to uh, the Mercer County Superintendent review, I assume they review the other districts' budget. Is there feedback? Is there coordination among the the other districts? Like, are the other districts in the in the county having these same type of sound challenges sure. go to yeah. the same? I mean, a lot of a lot of our colleagues are using um, waivers and surplus this year. Um, they've saved bank cap. Um, other districts have had to cut um, significant staff, um, 20, 25 staff members due to um, loss of aid. We were actually able to to gather uh, additional state aid this year, but other of our colleagues, Robbinsville for one, got flat state aid, which is like negative state aid. Yeah. Um, so you know, we feel we're very fortunate this year. Um, to have gotten some additional monies uh, to help us combat that. But again, we're hoping that the health benefit blip that we have this year is just that, a blip, and that we'll return to a normal um, normal set of spending next year. Okay. Well, thanks. Anyone else from the board? Questions? Mark, you good? He was driving. Okay. <laughs> Not, I was just going to comment on one other thing. Like, compared to any, you know, I've been on the board a long time. Compared to any other year, like, the amount of feedback and preparation that the administration did, getting us ready for what was occurring this year was way beyond what we would have. So it's appreciated. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think I think the, the, the way we've been discussing the budget has been far more um, uh, productive because everybody is in on the discussion where you know we're able to go back to re research things in all of our committees uh, to bring back to the board so I think it was it worked well and we got started early on the process and we'll do the same thing you know this year as I, I joke but <laughs> as soon as we do this I'll start yeah. I'll start, start next year start over yeah okay everybody good yeah, I think we're awesome the fund budget 
Okay, we're going to now open the floor for public comment, um, specifically around the budget. Um, members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter of on budget. Just budget. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> members of the public are invited to address the board on the budget for a maximum of three minutes during the portion of the meeting. This portion of the meeting, you are asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond to or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by the district administration. And again, just a reminder, if you could, when you approach the, the uh, podium, to sign in. Public comment is now open. it on yes yes okay I'm good thank you um, my name is Kristen Coop I live at 5 Northwoods Drive in Pennington and I'm a member of the Hopewell Township I'd like to say good evening to Dr. Treese and the members of the board and especially to our parent representation that is here tonight um, I want to especially thank our parents for participating in this important dialogue surrounding elementary curriculum and for engaging in the community process of collaborating on our public education I'm, I'm sorry um, I would ask you to hold that. Sure. This is specifically around budget. And this is specifically relating to the cuts outlined for the budget. Understood. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Does Please. it count against my time? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you will not be docked. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you. clarifying. Yes. I just want to say I think it's a beautiful thing that we've seen so many parents here tonight, both to recognize the amazing teachers that we had in our district earlier and also to just take part in this responsibility that we have um, as parents and community members. Um, so thank you, Dr. Trees, for hosting a small information session this afternoon with the PTOs, several parent representatives as well, to share some more details about the proposed changes and the plans for the future of STEM. It's critical that the channels of communication are used and invitations for parent involvement are extended to ensure the collective awareness of these budget changes prior to critical decision-making moments. I wish we had had a little bit more time before the present moment to discuss this with the board. Dr. Treese's commitment to a dynamic STEM program is reassuring. However, I'm concerned the path forward of eliminating positions only to bring them back a year later is disruptive. The expectation that two individuals supporting math technology and STEM will be able to simultaneously improve math test scores across all schools while also writing a complete curriculum for a new STEM program is perhaps unrealistic. I hope that I am proven wrong, but what will happen to the future of STEM if the math scores do not go up in one year? Will STEM be on the chopping block again? How can we assured, be assured that STEM will, has a place in the future? And how many variables will change in elementary education while attempting to evaluate the specific impact of these positions on student learning? We have heard that class sizes in elementary will increase. Direct faculty to student positions are being decreased. All the while, teacher coaches newly trained in their field will learn to support 36 individual classrooms. How will you ensure that all the teachers use these coaches when not all the teachers use the STEM facilitators? These are high expectations for brand new positions. Dr. Treese, Mr. Colavita, I so appreciate your hard work and effort on the budget, and I recognize that these are incredibly difficult decisions, and a lot of thought and attention has been put into them, so thank you so much. And thank you for giving us a forum for voicing our opinions. I just feel strongly that elementary education shouldn't bear the brunt. Thank you for the extra five seconds. <laughs> thank you. Shall I stay or sit? I can sit. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Um, Ryan Kennedy, 104 West Broad Street, um, the Hopewell Borough. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, here uh, just on my own behalf, not any organization or governing body or 
grove of trees or genus of animals or industry. I'm just myself and, and my kids here uh, tonight. And uh, I come to show and offer support on this budget uh, to this board and administration as it continues to reflect the priorities of this amazing community. I also, be honest, I come here with no particular expertise on the things you're talking here tonight, other than perhaps knowing that your jobs are really hard and almost always thankless. And as one of the nearly three people that came to the first budget coffee, um, I, I, I know um, that likely myself and the people on this side of the dais don't necessarily have the answers or the magic bullet to help you guys do what you need to do beyond what I'm going to do right now, uh, which is to, to thank you. Um, during COVID, and frankly, the whole time of my family's time here at Hopewell Valley with the school district, uh, we've taken the emphasis and resources put towards STEM for granted. Uh, it's one of the things that I tout about this district and this community when I'm talking about it. And it's something that I'm just absolutely thankful that we had during those lost COVID years. Our community's investment in collaboration and outdoor spaces on nature and science saved us, I think, during those years. And I'm thankful we've had as much of it as we, we could. And I'm not necessarily here to ask for any specific action. There's no magic trick about budget surplus or things that I'm studying. I know you guys know more about that than anyone, despite the number of meetings I might come to and, and wish I had an answer. Uh, I know I don't. Um, but to just to be enough among the voices here to tell you how appreciative we are of what this district has provided our students when it comes to STEDGE education, and that your investment in them in that is noticed. It's noticed by my family, it's noticed by my kids. They tell me they feel the change they are making when they plant something, when they connect with outdoor spaces that STEM education has brought us. And it's not just the direct investment you've made, there is a tremendous multiplier effect on STEM education with outside funding, the joint work with great partner organizations that we see in this community that support it. As you continue to wear community's priorities, I'm here to thank you, and thank you that STEM continues to remain a priority for you and for us. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Joanna Mora. I'm a director uh, at Bristol My Squibb. I'm a scientist, very passionate about STEM. Um, but I also understand the difficulties. Um, through my career, I had to let go three scientists. So uh, I know the difficulties of budget. I, uh, we encounter them in our industry too. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge how I see the difficult job you have. Um, but I've also seen the influence that our STEM teacher had at Hope Elementary. Um, and recently this year, I worked with her to give a presentation on um, uh, cell therapy. And it really ignites the kids. Uh, afterwards, a couple of parents reach out to me to say that the kid got home so excited about learning and stuff. So um, I wanted to share that because sometimes the, the little, those things that may seem little are the ones that really um, bring the learning to a new level. The other thing that uh, occurred to me while when I was hearing about this topic is that, boy, if I were part of this staff and I take on a position and and, and leave my other position as a direct teacher. And I'm excelling in it. I'm doing so good and getting awards, and yet my position is being eliminated. What message that that sent to those that would apply to now these teacher leader roles that are not directly working with the staff too, right? It's, it, I understand your dilemma, but I'm thinking like, man, that sounds wrong. Like, I, and I know, 
in your industry, it, maybe there's no like performance evaluation like there is in mine. So it's easier for me to let go of stuff that is not performing as well and, and keep the one that's excelling. I just wanted to share that through my eyes in, 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 in the part that I think is very challenging. Thank you. Anyone else? Kim Johnson, 48 Orchard Avenue in Hopewell Township. A survey was conducted in February at Timberlane for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade children that asked very private and personal questions. I'm not quite sure this survey would be legal. I'm sorry, is this related to budget? Yes, it is, by the third paragraph. Oh, okay. Um, not quite legal, would not be legal in a place of employment, let alone a school full of children. One question asked the children was, as young as 11 was, what is your sexual orientation? One of the goals of this survey was to find out how comfortable students are with speaking to parents about these topics. Based on the results of this survey, it is now necessary to have teachers attend a workshop about how to have courageous conversations with students. There's a lack of transparency here. Most parents are unaware that this survey occurred in the first place, um, unaware that this survey occurred in the first place, and if they were told by their children that they were asked these questions, they were not told anything about the objectives or findings of the survey. This is not acceptable. This pits parents against the schools and leaves children in the middle. This makes me wonder what happened that prompted this survey to be necessary in the first place. Is there an issue that we don't know about? Many of these children still believe in Santa Claus and you are asking them about their sexual attitudes and beliefs. That should be a private conversation between parents and their children. It does not belong in the classroom. It's very concerning that you are reshuffling teachers from the elementary school STEM program and are considering removing middle school sports while you focus on taking over the role of the parent. At a time when we are tightening the budget and children are experiencing significant learning loss, it seems to me that this district is prioritizing DEI over academics. I have a few questions about the teacher workshop that is planned in response to the results of the survey. Can you please share more about what teachers will be learning in the workshop and how students will be impacted? And is there a third party conducting the workshop, either directly or indirectly, by providing resources? And if so, what is the name of this organization and what is the cost to the district? We all want what's best, what's in the best interest of our children. If that's the case, why not partner with the parents instead of leaving them in the dark? There is a lot to fill out here. It's like people are really taking their time up here. Brian, you did not fill it fully. Hi, my name is Kate Elliott. I live at 46 North Greenwood Avenue in Hopewell Borough. My kids attend Hopewell Elementary, Timberlane Middle School, and the Central High School. Um, I'm coming tonight wearing mostly my mom hat but like it's hard to take off the former employee teacher hat so I'm gonna kind of like balance both hats on my head um, uh, the first thing I want to say is I, I think a lot of what you're saying is amazing and definitely stuff the district needs um, absolutely there's been a ton of new curriculum introduced in the last few years and it is a lot to ask the staff to be implementing that. 
I think the recognition that the K-12 supervisor positions are fundamentally ineffective, especially often at the elementary level, it's just too large a job um, with not enough focus. Obviously, it's difficult to stand up here and say, yes, do that, and keep doing everything else, right? The money has to come from somewhere. I will just say um, my children have been greatly impacted by both the STEM position at the elementary level and the technology position that is also being um, cut, which I'm not sure is quite talked about, but I think is, is also happening, the two um, technology teachers at the two elementary schools. Um, I will say that from a staff position, when you talk about um, a 22% special education uh, chunk, a quarter of our kids, right? As somebody who taught all of those students at once, they weren't pulled out. I was a librarian for anybody who doesn't know, elementary librarian. Um, it's really challenging to support all of those students when they come, often unsupported, with paraprofessionals, right? Didn't have a co-teacher. As a special area teacher, I often relied on the STEM teacher, on Vicki Opst, who was my technology uh, teacher at the time, it's now Chelsea McLean, to support me so I could teach robust lessons to those students by having another, another person with me. And I know that our elementary school classroom teachers do the same. They are able to teach more robust science lessons and technology lessons when they have another person in the room with them. It's just, it's an issue of like mathematics, like it's too many kids to help. Um, so I would just urge that you- um, Your time is up, I'm sorry. <laughs> focus on that. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Eileen Gerwitz. I live at 1 Tyburn Lane, Hopewell Township. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, I recognize the challenges that you are facing, um, but I still feel the need to advocate for my child and the other students in his school. Um, my son is a, a student of Hopewell Elementary School, and as a parent, I'm concerned about the impact that these cuts will have on my son and the other children in the school. Um, and I'm, so, I'm sorry, I used the word cuts, the pause in funding, as we're um, calling it now. <clears throat> uh, technology and STEM are essential skills for t success in today's economy. In fact, a recent study by the U.S. Department of Labor found that STEM jobs are growing at a twice the rate of all other jobs. By cutting these programs, we are putting our students at a disadvantage. They'll be less prepared for jobs of the future and less competitive in the global economy. In addition, these pauses in funding will have a negative impact on the quality of education at our school. Technology and STEM programs are not just about learning facts and figures. They're also about developing critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, and creativity. These are all essential skills that our students need to succeed in school and in life. <clears throat> Many of the most impactful lessons that we hear about from our kids happen in the STEM classroom and in technology. In fact, for those of you that know my son, you'll be surprised to hear that STEM and technology rank above phys ed. <laughs> and so that's a very high praise. Um, <clears throat> I would like to add that by cutting these programs or pausing the funding for these programs, um, it also is gonna have a negative impact on the school's morale. Our teachers are passionate about teaching STEM and the support that they receive from the STEM facilitators and the technology um, support is so important for them to continue to doing so. Um, our students are also passionate about learning from these excellent teachers that we have. Uh, by pausing these programs, we are sending the message to the faculty that we don't value their work 
and to the students that we don't value STEM and technology. These specials are one of the things that make Hopewell Elementary so special. I urge you to please reconsider the proposed pauses to the funding of these programs. Um, you know, our child's lives have been on pause. You know, I have a third grader. His life was on pause from kindergarten through second grade in one way or another. And I just ask you to please don't pause it again for another year. Thank you. Anyone else? Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Laura Swicky. I live at 242 Federal City Road in Pennington, New Jersey. Um, good evening, Board of Education members. I'm here tonight to voice my deep concern regarding the cuts to the STEM and technology facilitators across our elementary schools. From my understanding, the district plans to embed STEM and tech into general education lessons. This might sound okay on paper, but the, re the reality is that these lessons will be a sheer add-on to the vast curriculum that general ed elementary teachers are already expected to complete. Consolidating STEM and tech instruction within general education will have a negative impact on our children's futures and is a true disservice to them. We live in an increasingly digital and technological world where STEM and tech subjects are becoming more and more important. Schools across the state and nation are ramping up STEM and tech subjects as these lessons provide meaningful learning Eliminating STEM and tech facilitators at the elementary level seems illogical. These subjects are not just important for future job prospects, but also for critical thinking skills, problem solving, and creativity. By removing these passionate teachers from the schools, we are depriving our children of a crucial opportunity to develop the specialized skills they need to succeed in the future. Our dedicated STEM and tech facilitators at the elementary level are particularly important because they lay the foundation for future learning. Children's brains are like sponges at this age, and they absorb information at an incredible rate. By exposing them to STEM and tech at an early age, we are setting them up for success and giving them the tools they need to thrive in the future. Furthermore, STEM and tech education is not just about learning specific skills. It's so much more in the classroom, collaboration, innovation, creativity, something that is not taught necessarily in math and English. These skills are transferable to any field and are essential for their success in the future. Removing specialized STEM and tech facilitators from elementary schools sends a message to our children that these subjects are not important, which it actually should be the complete opposite. These are very important subjects. This could have long-term consequences on our, our children. We must recognize the importance of STEM and tech and invest in our children's future by providing them with the best possible resources and opportunities these subjects are essential for our children's future success, and it is our duty to ensure that they receive the education they need to thrive in this modern world. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I didn't come here and I didn't write a speech. I Came Could you here. introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's okay. My name is April Johnson, uh, 2465 Pennington Road in Pennington. I have three children uh, that go to Stony Brook. I have one middle schooler, I have one high schooler, and one graduate from high school. Thank um, you. I'm kind of going to go impromptu, okay? Much respect for every single individual here that's on the board, parents, and so forth. Thank you so very much. This is a very, very big deal. Um. 
I've been in this district for almost four years now. And we moved to this district about seven months before the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, it was very traumatic for everybody. New school, new everything. And then we just didn't go to school no more. And we had our Chromebook. And the switch of back and forth was not consistent. And what kept my kids wanting to go back to school, because it started out as going to school every other day, and then um, my child that was in first grade switched teachers in the second half. And what was consistent for him was his sports and STEM. And being a parent of six children, it is very, very important for consistency. And with this upcoming proposed pause, not cut, it shows inconsistency. That's not what children, any child, should come up to. Inconsistency. STEM is very, very good. Technology is thriving every single year. Next year we might have an iPhone 20. I don't know. Okay. But robotics and everything, STEM and all these programs are actually coming. There's extra curricular activities like through the Y program out here at the Hopewell Y. They, ha they have a, a program that you can pay a little extra and you stay an extra additional hour, you know, after school and do the robotics and do STEM. It works for everybody. And for this, you guys are in such a catch-22 position, I feel for you guys. There has to be some way that we should keep the consistency of keeping the STEM program and the hardworking STEM professionals that show our children how to work and succeed in the world. I have an upcoming senior next year, and he likes STEM, and he likes robots, and he likes all of it, and I want him to thorough us for that. So next year, if it's just cut and dry because it's on a pause, hi, Mr. Pell, that it doesn't show consistency. Thank Please you. Reconsider. Hi, my name is George Schaefer. And I have uh, three kids here in Holgate, um, and yeah, basically I'm 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 here to support the STEM program. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's quite ironic that uh, in this day and age we are canceling a science program when we're thanking science for getting through all the health and everything else. So to me, it's it's um, I'm looking at this going ninety four million dollars. I know, I understand, it's probably quite a bit to try to figure this out, but my question is very simple. What is the next best option? So I'd like to know what else was considered to cut or to change instead of them. That's all. Thank you. No one else? Okay, public comment is now closed. Um, absolutely. Um, and I, th I think all the parents that came to my um, small information session who came here tonight to also share your feedback. Um, and know this, um, I built, I was one of the ones that helped build this STEM program. And so one, I think we're um, confusing and conflating program with putting a pause on, on the positions. The technology um, positions are a part of this too, but when we say STEM, it's sort of like STEM is all encompassing with the facilitators, but STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. So when we rolled out this program years ago when it started as a magnet school at Bear Tavern, and it was just a small group of students that we identified, 
we trained all of our teachers, including the ones at the middle school for those STEM kids that were rolling up, in STEM and engineering design practices. That is why we have art teachers at the high school that students are being recognized. That's why we have a wellness teacher at, Timber at Tollgate who's being recognized in the Heckinger Report, who's gonna come interview and, and watch what we're doing in our field day this year. Um, it's because we do STEM everywhere and it is integrated across content areas, including art. Um, so those trainings have been happening. All of our teachers have been trained on how to use a 3D printer. They all know the engineering design process. And when we decided that it wasn't good enough to just have STEM at Bear Tavern, we needed it for all, it was proposed that we had these STEM facilitators who were initially trained as coaches to support teachers to do the work in their classrooms. Elementary teachers are already responsible for teaching science, math, English, language arts, and to integrate technology in their classroom. We've been one-to-one -one for years. So we've trained teachers on project design. We have pre-engineering programs throughout the middle school and the high school. None of that's being cut, nor is our robotics. We are just repurposing these positions right now so that we have the support that they need to make sure that they have the fundamentals. Yes, we want our students to be excited about being an engineer, they have to be able to do the math to be an engineer. They have to understand the science to be an environmentalist. They have to be able to read the technical text that they encounter in all of these subject areas. So, you know, while I, while I understand the reservation here, I also hope that I have a proven track record with you all, that I study ver things very closely. I've been saying this for a while that we need the coaches in addition to and right now, we are just at a critical area right now where I can't let our kids fall any further behind. And while I love our STEM facilitators and they've done phenomenal work and they've been recognized heavily, that hasn't been consistent. All of our students are not getting the same experience with STEM because one, we never designed the propositions to do what they've been doing. So I think we need to be, I know that we need to be intentional about it. We need to spell out these positions in a way that all kids are experiencing it, not just the teachers that invite their kids in, not just if you happen to have a certain person versus another person, having consistency. Because I've also heard loud and clear that it is inconsistent between the buildings. Um, so these, these are, this is just taking a step back, making sure that I'm getting you all the best bang for your buck. And I'm also making sure that kids are able to do what we are supposed to be make, helping them do, which is learn their math, learn their science, learn how to read critically, learn how to read and decode text, all of that across content areas. They will not be writing all the curriculum. We have invested in very expensive curricula. How it's been rolled out has not been consistent. Um, we have been providing teachers lots of training, giving them support in the classroom level. We haven't provided with the K-12 supervisor and no supports underneath. Other districts and neighbors of ours have these supports in place at the coach level. They have multiple layers of supervisors, which I can't justify adding this year. I can't do that. What I can do is make sure that we have people that are, are working at the classroom level and the technology that's being implemented. These software programs are aligned to content areas. We have language arts software. We have math software. We have science software. Having those people that are working in those roles be the experts in those platforms that are designed for those curricula, that makes sense and that's gonna be a strong support for them. Is this it? No, we're gonna need more layers. I'd love to have it all right now. And understand there's already flux with our staff, with people resigning, people wanting to move into other positions that are opening up through retirement. Everyone that you think might be in somewhere may not be because there's movement going on. So now as we're staffing and we're thinking about these moves, thinking about the request for transfers, thinking about who's qualified and who's not, um, it's time to really think about what can we focus on to fix the issues we have and get the best bang for our buck in a very bad year. So what have we considered? We have cut positions, we've absorbed positions, we consolidated con uh, positions, we've done away with software programs, we've done less with more, we've done all of that and we still need to fix this problem that I just pointed out to you. Um, so um, I, I think I touched on everything here. I know that we'll get into it more when we talk about the committee work. 
but that's why the recommendation, um, that's why I think that we need to really focus on what we're doing so that the teachers are getting the support that they need in the classroom, and so are our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Treese. Okay. Moving on to the remainder of the agenda. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes, I need a first and a second to adopt the budget. Motion. Okay. Do we need roll, roll call? Ms. Driver. Yes. Dr. Genovese. Yes. Dr. Lilliston. Dr. Liu. Uh, Mr. Peters. Jumped off. <laughs> Dr. Resnick. Yes. Mr. Sawicki. Yes. Dr. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Williams Galliano. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Okay. <coughs> oh, he can't get it. Okay. Did he give you a. All right. We have a majority anyway. Yeah, we're good. All right. Budget passes. I think. I think we. I think we should go into that. How about that? On the new thing. Okay. All right. Um. I'll give people a moment to <laughs> adjust. Okay. Um. We do have a open public comment for um on any item so the members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting we are asked you are asked to state your name address and municipality in response to your comments the board of education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so the board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by the district administration public comment is now open Okay, seeing none, public comment is now closed. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and move on to, I'm asserting there are no old business items. Okay, uh, go ahead to the consent agenda items. I need a motion and second. Motion and second to approve the consent agenda or pass the consent agenda Lawson. item. Second. Okay. So all in favor? Oh, sorry. Any questions? <laughs> now all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Okay. Consent agenda items are approved. We're going to go ahead and go into all of our committee reports. Um, we'll start with Mr. Sawicki. Okay. Uh, Finance and Facilities had a meeting uh, last Monday. Uh, all the items were on consent, but I'll just highlight a couple things. Uh, some of the things we wound up approving were uh, substantial completion of the HVAC work at Stony Brook, so it's good to get the vast majority of that done. Um, we had a discuss. One thing we approved was um, a renewal on our food service agreement, and we're heading towards, um, you know, completion of that overall agreement. So we had the the committee had a discussion about uh, school lunch costs, the cost of the meals we have, and you know, heading towards the next time we go out for a uh, food service contract. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a discussion with regard to courtesy busing. That's part of been the overall. It's been part of the overall discussion about the budget. So we started researching that. Um, uh, got an update on the facilities. Uh, one good bit of news is that uh, over at Timberlane last month, we noted that we had a problem with uh, the sewer system for one of the bathrooms. Uh, the good news is that um, we got a much more favorable cost for the bid for expediting that work. So 
that, that that's good news. Um, we also had a discussion uh, led by uh, Anthony Tanzini and Chuck Brandy from Integri uh, Integrity Consulting Group. They're the folks who help us with our uh, health insurance. So we had an overview of how we're doing there. So, you know, as sort, sort of an important thing related to the budget, over the past prior years, we've been doing very well with our self-insurance. This year is definitely much more of a challenge. I think the figure we got through uh, February was that we were this year in deficit uh, $900,000. So, again, another one of those budget challenges that we've had to face. Um, because of that, we'll have to adjust our budgeted premium for next year. We've had it stable for a couple of years. Um, one other thing that's a consideration in terms of uh, how our self-insurance costs are working are the fact that our uh, balance of staffing enrolled in our Direct 15 plan versus the New Jersey Educators Health Plan is changing over time, which we knew it would because of um, those people hiring and have to go into the Educators Plan. That mix is influencing how much uh, we wind up having to expend for the self insurance. So um, I think that's the, the majority of it. We are looking into some mechanisms for potentially uh, finding some savings as far as prescription costs, for example, a proposal was given. So we'll continue to look into those items. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. We're going to move. move on to personnel. Okay. All right. So we met today um, prior to the board meeting this evening and before the reception for the Governor's you know, uh, Educators Award uh, recipients. Um, uh, on the agenda today, you probably would see um, a retirement of Greg Harkins, the CSO from Tolgate, who's been with the district for since 2011, so a uh, big loss um, for him, but wish him well in his future endeavors. Um, you will see some long-term substitute appointments um, with some teachers to cover some teachers that are going to be on a leave of absence. There's plenty of adjustments to salaries um, for staff that's picking up um, some classes and due to a few leaves. There's the addition of some substitute teachers and some paraprofessionals and uh, staff for the grant-funded programs that usually happen over the summer. Um, additionally, you'll see some ECA appointments like coaches at the high school and some lunch duty help at uh, Tollgate. Uh, also included is the approval for the dues for our, um, our membership in the CJ Pride member, uh, group, uh, which we use all quite heavily for um, staffing finding some quality candidates to, to you know, fill some positions here. Um, you will also see that uh, what we discussed today was about the teacher leader positions, like the job descriptions for the literacy teacher leader and the math, science, and technology teacher leader of all the discussion this evening that was also included. We also uh, recognized um, the governor's educator and support prefer, prefer, uh, professionals uh, for the year. I think that was it. It was a rather quick meeting so that we could get on to the, the greater part of our time, which was the, uh, the governors, uh, the ed educators, now recipients tonight. So that was it. Thank you, Andrea. Oh, oh. oh okay. So I need a first and second to approve her items. Motion. Second. All in favor? Oh. Yes. 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 <laughs> we, um, the ed program met last week on Wednesday, if I remember correctly, I'm not quite sure. Um, and we had uh, a, a lengthy committee meeting, actually. We had some very good um, presentations 
Um, one was, the first one was from the special ed uh, supervisors, uh, Mr. Needham and Ms. Hoffman, right? Mrs. Hoffman? Yes. Um, and Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman. Yes. That's what I, I thought. That's why I was like, Ms. Hoffman? <laughs> so, um, so um, and they pretty much gave us a rundown of the, the, the different programs that we already offer, the students that we service, some highlights of some really fantastic things that are happening. Um, and uh, one thing that I took notice of is that what was happening in the with the with our little guys, you know, they were doing this yoga program, um, and she shared lots of pictures with the, the little guys doing their their yoga, and it was absolutely adorable. And I discovered through this presentation that the uh, foundation, the HBEF, um, they wrote a grant to get to bring that to them, and it was granted by the HBEF, um, and they're hoping to expand that and continue it uh, this year. Um, and just a little plug for them is that they do, HBEF is having a uh, fundraiser event coming up in May, um, May, Friday, May, May 12th, um, called Boots and Bling. You may or may not have seen it in your email, um, but strongly encouraged uh, for everyone to go. They do great things for our students and uh, um, bring to light some really wonderful things that our, our teachers dream up, and uh, so it would be fantastic if we could you know, not just us, but the community uh, join in um, and continue the great things like yoga with the preschool. Um, and then we also had another uh, really interesting. Can I chime in once more with that yoga? Absolutely. I, I know in their final uh, session with that instructor, they're actually welcoming in the families for the kids to show the, the families kind of some of the poses. And the moves. Oh, that's great. So, um, certainly not a not a session to miss. So. Oh, that's great. That's really great. I, I was like. When she showed me the pictures that she was doing with the, li the little the um, slideshow, that sealed the deal for me. Like it definitely seemed like something that was great. And if we can teach kids, you know, some of those um, important, you know, mindful things that when they're so little to hopefully carry them through, I think that's fantastic. So I was really excited about that. Um, so and then so the other presentation that we also had was um, this re restorative justice practices program that it looks like the county. Um, Detective Marlon Webb was the one who presented it to us. We've worked with him before, um, and he, they're trying to start this new program and partner with some schools so that we could um, not just, we don't want to punish our students when they do something, um, or whether inappropriate or insensitive, but so that we can provide them with some restorative justice instead. Um, so we're looking forward to making that partnership. Um, we also reviewed some field trips um, and some PD, and we talked about um, a math workshop course that we would like to bring to Kimberlyan. I think that's it. Do you want me to? And, uh, yeah. and a life skills course. A life skills course? Do you remember that? Life skills course. I do remember that. You're right. Because <laughs> <laughs> we wanted all our kids to take Yes, it we did. We did friends. talk about that. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write that down in my notes. I was so excited about the yoga that I didn't get that far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, life skills. We wish all of our students could take that. Our kids, not just our students. But that, that was it. So it was a good meeting, but it was a lengthy one, one longer than we usually have, but it was a good discussion. So thank you. You have uh, the new course that you? The math workshop course, you said? And then the life, course, life skills and the course. Life skills. Yeah. The we need to approve. Yes. Okay. So are you finished? So um, to adopt the new courses, uh, we need a first and second. Motion. Roll call. Dr. Lewis. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Yes. <coughs> yep. Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, moving on to community relations. Yes. Um, so uh, m most of my community relations was talked about earlier, so I'm going to just briefly say it again. Um, but w we talked about the superintendent's chats, one on May 18th around mental health and school safety that you heard in Dr. Teresa's update. Also the one on June 7th around drug awareness and safety. Um, we also talked about um, 
the upcoming uh, mid-June Express, where we're going to talk about some of our green activities, um, the uh, Yes Club that was mentioned by our student representative, and the trip to D.C. around climate change and mental health. Uh, talking about other Green Week activities, and then celebrating our seniors. Um, and then, oh, that, I, sorry, I was just reading my notes and didn't know what it was. Just so people know, we actually just finished up our Green Week, which ran from April 15th through the 22nd, so highlighting some of those activities. Um, and that was pretty much our meeting for uh, community relations. And then um, our social and emotional learning, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Treese because uh, I missed that meeting because I needed some social and emotional support. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, that's okay. We got you. Um, so we reviewed the May 3rd wellness activities that are going to be happening in PD, and I shared that schedule. I'm sorry I didn't answer that question when the um, – um, the community member asked about the TMS um, survey. Um, Timberlane is going to be using doing a, um, the DEI committee is leading a session at Timberlane around racial and biased comments, because they've had a lot of them, as we've seen in our um, HIBs. And so the committee of teachers is actually leading that PD, and it's around how do we work with this with our kids. And I think that they have actually have activities that they're going to turnkey with them that they'll do then with the students um, on social like specifically around their use of social media and I see one of our wellness digital wellness committee people out there and how you know we can we can start working on this problem um, the elementary schools will be focusing on character strong and um, they'll, they'll be um, working through workshops that the teachers will offer and the, um, the members of the SEL committee and on the secondary level uh, at the high school they're going to be um, doing a presentation on um, Teacher Hacks for AI and Chat GPT, uh, it is here. We know it's here. So how do we embrace it? And Because the kids are going to be using it. Adults are using it. Um, so you know, figuring out how we can embrace it and make it a part of our classroom, but also be aware that you know kids are going to cheat. So we need to be aware of that as well. Um, so that's what that professional development is going to be. So we talked about that as well and shared that and how that links to the social emotional work that we're doing. Um, E-learning days, May uh, 25th, is a social emotional learning day. I have shared the learning activities. Parents will receive an email from me. These are the things that your kids can work on in grain bands, and then um, you can do that, and the kids will can discuss the, the, the activities that they did when they return. We're also going to be offering a digital wellness challenge, where one of those days we're going to be inviting parents and their children to stay off of the social media naughty sites, like well, they're not necessarily naughty, but naughtiness <laughs> happens, like uh, TikTok and Facebook, and just kind of power down for the day and just see what it's like to not be on your technology, and you actually have to look at somebody and talk to them for the day. Um, we're going to ask them to track their, their feelings bef before, on a regular day when they're using their, their social media, and then the day without, and see if they can compare. Um, anyone who wants to share that with the committee, we're going to be looking for selecting some randomly selected um, ambassadors of those people that want to share those experiences. What was it like powering down, and what lessons would I like to bring back to the committee um, for future PD for, and for future um, offerings for our community? So that's what we talked about. Oh, and then we also talked about the restorative justice program that Detective Webb and the pr prosecutor's office is offering. Um, I just wanted to clarify that this is restorative circles around racial bias or racial um, incidents or crimes that happen in the district that we select that are we, that we think rise to the level that we want them to come in and run this a circle. They're going to train our students, our middle school and high school team, a team of students and a teacher in each building. And then when we identify this is a case we want to run through a restorative circle, um, we just had a couple recently this year that probably could have qualified. Um, they'll work with us in an educational way. And then if the same student is a perpetrator again at something that rises to that level, um, they, they will be working with them through education through the, through the department and a station house adjustment and all of that. Um, know that we, the co prosecutor's office and our local police departments know of every bias incident and crime, possible crime we have. We have to report it anyway. So instead of it becoming a station house adjustment right away, this is a nice interim step where the kids can work through how do they fix it. 
um, and, our, and our student body has a way in on that. Um, so that's what that program is that, that he's offering to us for free. And then um, Phil's Beans was here today. Um, we just kind of talked about that. That was starting today at uh, Phil's Drills. And he's been working, uh, he started at Stony Brook today, and he's going to be going through all of our elementary schools doing movement, wellness, and some mindfulness. He's also a nurtured heart trained person, so he's been working with our kids in some, um, some fun games. So that was it. That's what we talked about. Next slide. Excellent. Okay. So since you brought up the subject of this survey um, that was given to the kids, was that, did, did, did the board ever get to discuss the survey, at least in the so committee, or? This, and again, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to, I'm gonna have to get back to you on this, but okay. I believe this was just like a survey that a teacher gave to say, how would you like to be addressed? Are you a member of the LGBT community? What can we do to make you feel so comfortable? this was a teacher? This was like one small, like a small survey that was given. One, the principal acknowledged that it should have been, even if it's just a small classroom, how to, how can we, you know, or, or a small uh, group of students, it should have been communicated to the parents beforehand. Misty and Freddie reached out to the parents and acknowledged okay. that. And um, it wasn't like, what's your sexuality? It's more like, well, how can we make you feel comfortable? What group okay. do you identify with? Uh, uh, right, I, I, and all I wanted to, and I'm glad to hear that Ms. and Freddie uh, yeah. addressed it right. I just feel like these kinds of things, especially on subjects that are controversial in the current mm -hmm. environment, should be something that there should be some kind of a review on the board. Agree. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. But again, yeah. it wasn't, it was like, right. how do we, but still, even that, we, it should have been, yeah. those things were acknowledged and they understand. Cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Moving on to policy. Uh, can I have a motion to move the items up for first reading? Great. Okay, so what we have this week is, uh, or this month, is first the HVRSD org chart, and then we have policy and regulation uh, 5200 on attendance. And when we had our meeting about a week and a half ago, we had a very long, lengthy, enjoyable, and lively conversation about attendance. One might say, oh, attendance, you're either there or you're not. Well, you look at the fact that we've got an 18-page regulation on attendance, and that tells you how complicated the subject is. And I just want to thank Dr. Treese, Ms. Riley, and Ms. Gianfredi because they brought both their perspectives as educators, administrators, and as parents to the discussion. And I think based upon that, we made a lot of good, uh, we, we got a lot of good feedback. Uh, you'll note in what was provided to the board, we started with the state changes. There's a lot of things that are optional. The stuff that became optional, we made a lot of changes to. So I'll just highlight some key things that are changing in this uh, regulation. There's a clarification on attendance for home instruction. It's actually more complicated than you think. Uh, what's required to actually get credit for a full day? You know, it's half day attendance, but it makes a difference whether you're a first grader or a kindergartner, even though both go full days. Um, clarification of state excused absences. There's been a lot of changes there. One change we made was uh, previously it was it, it stated college visits. We thought it important to make it clear that career exploration for our career focused students should be an option for them to explore as well. Um, calculation of the absenteeism, absenteeism rate. That's actually been something of a challenge for us. So uh, we got some really good feedback from the principals on that. Uh, and then a whole discussion about what constitutes an excused absence. So we put in a clarification to make it clear that mental health is important as well as physical health and, and making that an obvious uh, case for allowing an excused absence. Uh, put in some specific items for parental and physician notification just to make that clear and, and promote some consistency. Um, preparation of assignments if a student's going to be missing an extended period of time, putting some something more uh, concrete into the policy, into the regulation to, to again drive consistency, and um, just some changes to the the truancy procedures based upon the feedback from our administrators. So, first reading. Obviously, we'll have time for 
uh, you know, other feedback, but uh, the policy committee is recommending uh, this be approved for first reading. All those in favor? Uh, oh, sorry. You were looking down. I actually have a question. Yes. <laughs> so I actually read this policy <coughs> because. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, uh, yeah. Um, I have a question, and it's it's the parental excuse letter. It's uh, it's actually not a question. It's a suggestion for clarification. When I first read the statement, I read it as it's up to four days with an excuse letter, and then if you're absent five days, they give you the doctor's note, which is reasonable. In, in fact, it's probably less than four days as a as a as a single duration period. Then I reread it. And I said, "Oh no! What that actually says is you get four days a year as a parent, where it's just your letter. So we should clarify that." That it's okay. that it's because it's not. Yeah, I had to read it twice and go. Wait a minute. Yes, that yes, four days total per year. Right. It should be somewhere per year. So I was going to make that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no. 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 It's it's literally where it says you. Yeah, you get four notes that you send in for an excuse absence per year. Fifth one is NOLA, so if your child is at some point, do you need to start going to the doctor? Which is probably not a bad idea if your child is ill that much. Um, uh, yeah, so that was my question. And then the other one I actually had is um, I noticed that family illness or death is not checked. Um, as an excuse absence and family death, if there is a death in a family, I would imagine we may want to make that an excuse absence. And it's just so, this is all, they're both in the same section, B.2, .B, and I'm just looking at my yeah, screen. I'm seeing it now. It, it's not specifically checked. And, and I think my recollection of the discussion is that based upon some prior experiences, having a, we had people with multiple very ill parents, oh, right. multiple uh, deceased relatives. So, so there were some challenges there. So I think the point was that just because something is checked doesn't mean that the administrators don't have the discretion to permit it but we have but you know we, we had to be a little bit clearer there just because of some of you okay. so again very good feedback I, you know I think we'll yeah 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 I have So question on some, um, supporting mental well-being. Um, it, it's pretty vague in here. And unlike, you know, when you've got strep throat, um, you know, a child can be seeing a counselor on a regular basis, still have mental health challenges, but you're not going to go see that doctor every time your child is absent. So where in this policy are we supporting parents with those types of absences that can be very unannounced, very frequent. Yeah, I know. So like a 504 or nine. But there's a pattern. So his father died, he had a hard time coming to school after that, and he wasn't coming to school. That's not the plan. The kids community will consider all that. It's just the This is just like the baseline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So which policy would that, so what I'm saying is, I think you're trying where, to help parents clarify. Yeah, I'd like to what, see it in a policy or tell, like, how they not in this it. policy, it should be, we should note it. be noted in the policy so at so speaking as a parent right now no, I had no idea that that was actually a thing it's being added it's being it's it's not it's no, being no, no, no 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 that if your child has an IEP and has significant absences it doesn't follow our absentee policy No, 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 I understand what you're saying. But I'm saying nowhere in this policy, as a parent reading this policy, does it tell me that that is okay. Do you understand what you're saying? So even if you have a, an IEP, oh, well, I don't know. I think it's, you know what I'm saying? I like, it should be clear. I think it yeah. says in here that the, the, the discretion of the, super, the, um, the principal and the committee can do that. But we'll, we can say that. Um, okay. We have to be very careful, though, about giving too much space for people's own interpretation yes. of, yes. oh, my child yes. can, because this policy is designed to stop truancy. Yes. Right? And yeah. you don't want to <laughs> up and say one day, yep. oh, my child was having mental health problems, right. no documentation of it, yes. no evidence of it. So, you know, yep. when we have, um, in addition to all these things where it refers to these codes and things, it's that sending letters when you miss four days, having a meeting. Have, we have to have protocols around all how to that. do some sort of intervention. And, and by the time you get to like eight, nine absences that are unexcused, you have a plan. And then we're working okay. with you. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily coming to school and you, you know, yeah. you as much as we would like. Um, but they were there's something to there. So yes, we'll, we'll figure out. Okay. So I think the the yeah. bottom line is is just m looking for more clarity, well, clarity in the air, in that particular so area. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just vague when we start to mention mental health in yeah. here. So one last comment as a parent um, who <clears throat> uh, guilty of some things and but but also <laughs> had to deal with uh, not understanding what the policy is till I've gone ahead and read it. Once we adopt this policy, it might be a good idea to okay, have a little idea. summary, you already talked about right? It. Like a like a quick guide to attendance. Yeah, with a disclaimer that says, hey, we're not covering all the details. You yes. can go and look there. But for example, yes. Yes. the fact that we're going to have mental days and we're essentially treating them like sick days. The fact that if you want, if you as a parent want your, your child, you know, your child has a cold and they're out today, uh, that phone call is not enough. You'd have to send in a written note once the child comes back to school that says, this it is but before this policy parents could never just write a note without a doctor to help you excuse it. Yes. So it's always done excuse. Mm -hmm. And that's a change. Mm -hmm. Right. And and, and and I and I welcome that change because if you have a call and your child needs to be out for one day today just getting to a doctor is not, yeah. you don't right. get that's that right. appointment that's with them. Right. So, um, uh, right, but kind of making sure that people are aware of this mm -hmm. because this is the one thing that I, usually I can count on my kids to tell me what the rules are, yeah. and they usually write, this is the one thing that they're consistently wrong about. <laughs> Go figure. 
in both well but not always do there you would think that they're always oh. right but it's not they're they are clearly not aware of this and the parents are not aware of the of the fine details and we're going to be introducing some things in here that are going to be important for people no, fair enough and then also oftentimes kids are afraid to i don't want to i don't want to i'll get in trouble if xyz so yeah to your point yes no, or there's there's kids who don't want to go to school there's kids that you have to insist on you're running a fever nobody wants to see you in school and no exactly. you're not gonna lose exactly credit for play, right and exactly i'll be honest i had to deal with the other <laughs> right no, same thing. Like, I think the the the, the magic percentile is ten percent. Once we get to a ten percent absence number, things become much uh, more difficult. So, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, second. So. <laughs> second meeting. Yeah. So we're second meeting. We're gonna make some adjustments. Okay. So, so 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 wait. Did we ever do a? <laughs> no, we did yeah, not. We okay. Yeah. Okay. We did the motion. <laughs> oh, so hold on. We're voting on it's okay to first go to the reading. second reading. Yeah. First reading. First okay. reading. Yeah. This voice <laughs> Those on uh, <laughs> all in favor of first reading. Aye. Aye. Anyone abstaining or opposed? Okay. So moved. Okay. All right. So now, approved. I know we, we've managed to drive They're the like, whole audience uh, away. Um, <laughs> can, yeah. yeah. They're like, yeah. Can, can can I have a motion to move the items up for second reading, please? Motion. Okay. This is quick. We've got policy fifty four fifteen point five Title One, policy twenty seven hundred services to non public school students. Uh, policy and regulation 9270 homeschooling and equivalent education outside the schools uh, we discussed these last month no changes since that time we're recommending a motion to approve requesting motion we no no yeah. I was I was yeah. yep. Yep. Sorry. helping everyone else <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We're good. roll call vote please Bob <laughs> Yep. Yes. Yes. Ms. Driver. Yes. Dr. Genovese. Yes. Ms. Williams. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I think we're calendars. Calendar, calendar, calendar. Okay, calendar. So, Bob, you want. Motion. Do you want to. Oh. <laughs> Everybody's like ready to race to the end. Motion. M m Second. So, Bob, okay. do you want a meeting? Do you not want a meeting? That's fine. Yeah. Afternoon. Uh, so you sh don't we have? I. Don't we have a? Or do we have? Okay. 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 It should be fine though. Uh, for me to so we'll do it we'll do it quickly. So we? finance and facility at five PM on the fifteenth. Okay. Okay. Um who wants to go next? <laughs> Yeah, so whatever works for the rest of you.
Kevin. And you said the tenth worked best for you, Lydia. for me. What day was it? I'm sorry about I can do the third. Second or third at what? Nine. So, all in favor? Aye. So it's the, the, the board it will enter it into executive session to discuss the following um, HIV and no potential litigation. No action will be taken. I need one minute before we do mine. One. 